is uh, David Larson. He received a BA in Near Eastern Studies from BYU uh, back when they had that program before it changed to Ancient Near Eastern Studies. He's currently a master's student in theology at Marquette University and he runs a blog called Heavenly Ascents, which is a really good blog on uh, uh, LDS religion, so check that out. His paper is entitled Two High Priesthoods, Evidence for Changes in the Priesthood from First to Second Temple Judaism. So please welcome David Larson. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be here. It's, uh, I haven't been here on BYU campus since 2002, I believe, so it's great to be back. Um, I, uh, I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's in uh, Wisconsin, we don't have that technology yet, so uh, please bear with me. All right, this is based on a paper that I wrote for a class in Old Testament, and um, it's entitled, Two High Priesthoods, Evidence for Changes in the Priesthood from First to Second Temple Judaism. I'd like to start out reading um, from Psalm 110, from a translation done by A.R. Johnson. Thou hast the homage of thy people on the day of thy birth, in sacred splendor from the womb of dawn. Thou hast the dew wherewith I have begotten thee. Yahweh has sworn beyond recall, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 is one of only two passages in the Hebrew Bible that directly mentions the name Melchizedek, referring to calling a priest after his order. Sigmund Mowinkel, in his groundbreaking The Psalms in Israel's Worship, dates this psalm to the time of the Davidic monarchy, in the first temple period. In the history of the ancient temple priesthood that is received from the Bible, however, there is no record of any priesthood other than, than that which was given to Aaron. Where then does a priest after the order of Melchizedek fit in? Was there a change in the nature or constituency of the priesthood from first to, temple, first to second temple? It is my hypothesis that there was such a change and that traditions both within the Hebrew Bible itself and in non-canonical literature indicate that many non-Aaronic and non-Levitical figures demonstrate characteristics of and uh, supposedly exclusive to the high priesthood of Aaron. I will argue that the priesthood of some of these other figures can perhaps be described just as legitimately as high priesthood as that claimed by the priestly class known as the sons of Zadok in post-exilic Israel. A reading of the Hebrew Bible, on the surface, presents us with an unbroken line of Israelite priesthood that commences with Aaron's ordination to the office of priest, which continues in the descendants of Aaron through the monarchy and the exile and subsequently expresses itself as the theocratic leadership of post-exilic Jewish society, led by the priestly sons of Zadok, hereafter referred to as the Zadokites. The canonical books of Nehemiah, Ezra, and Chronicles, along with the priestly sections in the Pentateuch, are greatly responsible for our understanding of the establishment and continuation of the Zadokite order and their claim to the high priesthood. However, as these writings are seen as post-exilic, it was the Zadokites themselves who wrote these sections. Other strands of tradition found elsewhere in both canonical and in non-canonical documents seem to counter the Zadokite claim to exclusive priestly authority. Many passages in the Hebrew Bible describe inst instances in which non-Levitical figures are depicted as performing priestly functions. Addition additional Second Temple religious documents, including the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Anachic literature, are adamant in emphasizing, perhaps, uh, the origins of the priesthood in other figures prior to Aaron. Significantly, among those to whom the Hebrew Bible attributes priestly functions are Israel's kings and prophets. This apparent contradiction poses a, a challenge to the Zadokite claim of exclusive right to priesthood authority. 
Now, although the pre-exilic writings passed through the hands of the Zadokite editors, there yet remained many passages that did not fit their reconstructed history of the exclusiveness of the priesthood of Aaron. It is not difficult to find figures in the Bible who are not Zadokites, descendants of Aaron, or even Levites, but who nevertheless were depicted performing priestly functions. I will give just a brief overview. In the period of the judges, we have Gideon, who was commanded by Yahweh to build an altar and sacrifice a bull upon it. But Gideon was from the tribe of Manasseh. Manoah, who was of the tribe of Dan, who was the father of Samson, offered a burnt and a cereal offering at the request of the angel of Yahweh. Elkanah the Ephraimite, the father of Samuel, offers sacrifice at Shiloh. Also specific examples of non-Levitical priests are King David's sons, who are specifically called priests in 2 Samuel 8, Ira the Jairite, and the priest that Jeroboam appointed. None of these individuals has any apparent Aaronic or Levitical background, yet are permitted or even commanded by the Lord to offer sacrifice. Brother John Twetness alerted me to two additional groups who could be seen as non-Levitical non priests. First, there were the Nazarites, who, like priests, could not touch dead bodies. They were also forbidden to drink wine, while priests were not to consume wine in the temple. Is it possible that they were living a higher law of the priesthood? Furthermore, according to Brother Twetness, the term Nazarite is related to the Hebrew word nezer, which was an article of priestly clothing clothing, which we will discuss shortly. The second group is the Rechabites, descendants of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, who were incorporated into the temple priesthood in the, in the time of Jeremiah. The last group is a clear and stunning example of non-Levites being allowed to legitimately perform priesthood functions in the temple. Throughout the biblical text, the prophets are uh, uh, often performing priestly functions as well. And most are depicted as being closely tied to the sanctuary. Some, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, come from established priestly families, but most are not descendants of Aaron or Levi. Samuel, an Ephraimite, officiated in, in the sanctuary of Shiloh, offered sacrifices to the Lord and anointed the first kings of Israel with the sacred oil. It is significant that all, although first Samuel declares Samuel to be an Ephraimite, the Zadokites managed to make him a descendant of Levi in 1 Chronicles 6. Then there's the famous story of Elijah against the priests of Baal, where Elijah's offering is consumed by fire from the Lord. Although the priestly writings tell us that Moses made Aaron the priest, note he, he is not called high priest, Moses retains supreme authority over religious matters and is the true mediatorial figure between God and Israel. Aaron's function seemed to be that of a normal priest comp compared to Moses' role. Psalm 99.6 calls Moses a priest along with Aaron. And according to Goodenough, it was Philo's view that Moses was the true high priest. His mediation was far superior, his sacrifices more acceptable, and the Aaronic priests were secondary in position. While, as noted earlier, the Hebrew Bible only mentions Melchizedek twice, he is not an insignificant figure. In Genesis, he is depicted as the king of Salem and is both king and priest of God Most High. He brings an offering of bread and wine, receives tithes from Abraham, and blesses him. Josephus recorded a Jewish tradition that Melchizedek, not Solomon, had built the first temple in Jerusalem. The priestly writings delineate special items of sacred clothing that only the chief priest was to wear, distinguishing him from subordinate priests. Exodus 28 indicates that these items included, among other things, the ephod, the breastplate with the urim and thummim, a special robe, and a gold plate attached to the mitre or turban, which was inscribed with the words, Holiness to the Lord. For the Zadokites, 
It would certainly not have been permissible for even a Levite to use these sacred accessories, much less a non-Levite. Interesting enough, the biblical record gives us several instances where this indeed happens. The ephod was an apron-like vestment that was an indicator of priestly authority. Again, this was supposed to be one of the, item, the items that distinguished the high priest from other priestly figures. However, in the biblical text, we see many other figures using it, including Gideon, Micah, Eli, and Samuel, who is also depicted as using the special priestly robe. King David uses the ephod to inquire of the Lord in 1 Samuel 30. The Urim and Thummim were supposed to have been the possession of the high priest alone. Interestingly, the priestly writings never tell of Aaron actually using them. All inquiries to the Lord were made by Moses, making Aaron's possession of the Urim and Thummim seem superfluous. Despite a rather ambiguous mention of Eleazar the priest in connection with them, the principal instance of someone actually using the Urim and Thummim is King Saul. The Nezer, mentioned pre uh, previously, was worn by the high priest over or on front of his turban. This item, usually translated as crown, may have been the gold plate that was attached to the front of the sacred headgear. According to the text, on it were inscribed the words, Holiness to the Lord. Later Jewish writers would assert that this was not the true inscription, but it, that it was the four letters of the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, that were inscribed. If this is the case, it would likely indicate that the high priest was to be seen as representing Yahweh himself as he performed the expiatory rites. This would impose a special status indeed if he were the only one chosen to wear it. However, both King Saul and Joash are described as wearing the Nezer, which could mean that the kings also would have been seen as the representative of Yahweh. Although it is not expressly stated, the Davidic kings are portrayed essentially as priests in the biblical text. The prophet Samuel anointed Saul and David with oil, passing on holy authority from God. The priestly writings describe the high priest as receiving such an anointing. While Saul was censored by Samuel for offering sacrifice at Gilgal, David, Solomon, and Ahaz openly make sacrifices with the apparent approval of the people, prophet, prophets, priests, and God. The Davidic kings also had the prerogative to bless the people, which right was reserved to the priests in Numbers 6 and 1 Chronicles 23. The monarchy seemed to have special access to the sanctuary as well. In 2 Samuel 7, David goes into the Lord's tent and sits before the Ark of the Covenant in the presence of the Lord, which was a posture forbidden to even the high priest. He does this with the apparent approval of Nathan the prophet, who has just been with him. Solomon does similarly, entering the temple and standing before the Ark which, as mentioned, the high priest would only do at specified times. David makes plans for the great house of the Lord, and Solomon builds and dedicates it. In all cultic events, the Davidic kings are not merely invited by the priesthood to participate, they are presiding over them. For example, David is responsible for bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He takes an active and presiding role in the religious procession that ensues. He wears the priestly ephod, dances before the ark, offers sacrifice, makes a feast, and blesses the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. He does not do these things after asking the priest's permission, nor is he simply substituting for absent priests. They are apparently subordinate to, to him. He organizes the ranks of the priests and the Levites. David is washed, anointed, and changes apparel just like the priests. He walks into the house of the Lord and worships as if it were his own personal royal chapel. The royal palace was actually adjacent to the temple, and the kings had their own private entrance to it, later known as the royal portico. Another important event is Solomon's dedication of the new temple in the first book of Kings. 
Solomon directs and is responsible for the building of the house of the Lord. He personally conducts the dedication ceremony, blesses the people, offers the dedicatory prayer, and makes sacrifice to the Lord. He also consecrates the middle court for additional sacrifices. All of these actions were holy rites that, according to the priestly history, would have to have been performed by the priesthood. Many of the Psalms, especially those known as the Royal Psalms, help us to understand the nature of kingship in ancient Israel. These Psalms, despite their applicability to Jesus Christ, appear to have their original seats in Laban in the, in the Davidic monarchy. Psalm 2, 6-7 declares, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That the king was considered the son of God is also supported by 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 1 Chronicles 22, 10, where both David and Solomon, respectively, are called son by God himself. In Psalm, <clears throat> excuse me, in Psalm 89, 27, the Davidic king is designated firstborn. Rather than being sons of God by birth, however, it can be interpreted that these are adopted as God's son upon being anointed king. Further evidence for the king as representative of Yahweh is found in a rather shocking passage in 1 Chronicles 29, where Solomon is anointed king in place of his father David. Verse 23 states that Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king. It is explained that when Solomon is, is presented as king, David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God, and all the congregation blessed the Lord of their fathers, and bowed down their heads, and worshiped the Lord and the king. That's what it says. It appears that Israel recognized Solomon as a representative of the Lord, and Solomon even sits down on the throne of God, perhaps even the chariot throne in the Holy of Holies. According to Mettinger, Psalm 110 calls both Yahweh and King Lord, and depicts God inviting the king to sit down be beside God's throne. This should likely be understood as the king sitting on God's throne, sharing his power. The king, he explains, is God's co-regent, exercising delegated divine power. Okay, now, it's not likely that the people of Judah saw their king as a god, but as someone who represented God, standing in his place on earth. In fact, there is much evidence that the king led and participated in a ritualized cultic drama that took place during a yearly celebration of the new year, the Autumn Festival, the most important of all festivals in ancient Israel. Although not specifically delineated in the biblical text, we can piece together from different passages an event that is analogous to other ancient festivals that took place in Mesopotamia and elsewhere at the time. Mo Winkle saw in the Psalms a liturgy for this annual festival, a cultic dramatization of the victory of Yahweh over the forces of chaos, his creation of the cause, and his enthronement as king in the temple, which is paralleled and represented in a ritualized reenactment involving the earthly king. As this material has been so fully covered in previous research, um, and I don't have a whole lot of time, I will not go into it here today. However, possibly the most significant part of this liturgy for our understanding of the king's priesthood is the ritual described in Psalm 110, which deals with the king's rebirth. He has been ritually slain and then reborn and elevated for all time, not only to the throne, but also to the priesthood of Melchizedek. I will further discuss the Melchizedek priesthood shortly. In the words of Deborah Rook, the idea of the Israelite monarchy as an example of sacral kingship has become an accepted piece of received scholarly wisdom. And of course, one of the characteristics of sacral kingship is that it bestows upon its office holders a priestly role. Not only 
did he have some priestly functions, she says, but the king was also ex officio, the most important priest in the nation and had ultimate control over the cultic arrangements. The question for Bible readers arises then that if they had the priesthood, what was the nature of this priesthood? How, if they were not descendants of Aaron or Levi, could the kings or, or prophets have any priesthood at all? What was the source of their priestly authority? Before an attempt to answer this question can be made, I will first turn to the history of the post-exilic period, where not all parties saw history the way the Zadokites did. There is evidence that suggests that after the Babylonian exile, the Zadokite priest absorbed the cultic rites of the kings. The priestly historians did their best to hide the role that the Davidic monarchy played during the Babylonian exile. Okay. Um, as I'm short of time, I'm, I'm going to skip forward a bit. The second temple had a significantly different religion than the first. And even though most of the source material has passed through second temple hands, it is clear that a return to the original temple was part of the religious and political agenda for many sectarian groups in this period. For them, the rebuilt temple was both the cause and the sign of divine wrath. Scholars have identified priestly groups that appear to have been in opposition to the Zadokite priesthood in the Second Temple period. The main thrust of this dissent movement is known primarily by the literature it produced, which includes many writings including the figure of Enoch and other documents such as Aramaic Levi. The authors of, this, of these texts challenge the legitimacy of the Second Temple and its priesthood. One of the main repositories for this anti zadokite literature that we know of was Qumran. Although there is much scholarly debate regarding exactly who the inhabitants of Qumran were, many scholars believe that they were a priestly group that had seceded from or were excluded by the ruling Jerusalem priesthood. Many of these polemical texts found at Qumran were aimed at Zadokite claims to have a priestly authority by virtue of their connection to their ideal priestly source, Aaron. But many of these texts trace their priesthood back to figures such as Enoch, and even trace the, the priesthood back to Adam, who was the first king and priest. In these non-canonical traditions, there is found a belief in the, an uninterrupted line of priesthood succession from Adam to Seth to Enoch to Noah down to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is said to have passed the priesthood on to Abraham, making him the connection between the patriarch patriarchal priesthood and the Israelite priesthood. As Adam, Seth, Enoch, and Noah had been before him, Melchizedek was both, both king and high priest. The Davidic kings had been ordained in Psalm 110 to the priesthood of Melchizedek. It appears that in the eyes of some who rejected the second temple as corrupt and claimed ties to the first temple, the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek was a royal high priesthood that was superior to the priesthood of Aaron. I have previously pointed out that most of the information known about the Zadokite claim to the high priesthood comes to us from the Zadokites themselves. Outside of their priestly writings, we have little information about Aaron's priesthood or the office of the high priest. In pre-exilic texts, Aaron is actually never called high priest, but he and his sons are called priests by God. Not even Zadok is called high priest, but just priest. There is mention of a separate, there is no mention of a separate office of high priest, but only chief or head priest. A number of scholars express doubt that there ever was such an office, at least not as the, the Zadokites portrayed it. Summarizing her findings on the Aaronic High Priesthood, Deborah Rook explains, During the pre-exilic period, the High Priesthood, as seen in P, does not exist as such. Rather, the nearest equivalent to it was the Chief Priesthood in the Jerusalem Temple. This Chief Priest was not a figure of civil authority, nor even of supreme religious or cultic authority. Uh, instead, as a royal official, his position was of responsibility 
for practical matters. Compare the office of bishop. While it was the monarch himself who had overall responsibility for the cult and its worship, and who also had what might be termed high priestly responsibilities as the nation's representative before God. The Aaronic high priesthood, according to this line of thought, was a post-exilic creation, whereas the priests had previously been subject to the higher authority of the king. If this hypothesis is correct, after the monarchy had been suppressed, the Zadokites absorbed the priestly functions and even imitated the dress of the royal or Melchizedek high priesthood. The chief priest of pre-exilic times was the Kohen Harosh, which means the priest who is the head, or the head of the priesthood, or if taken as a subjective genitive, the head's priest, or that is, the king's priest. This latter interpretation would fit the pre-exilic picture of the king appointing the chief priests. The king had supremacy in religious matters for the state, and his appointed priests represented the king on certain occasions. Were there two high priesthoods then? I conclude that there were only one. There was only one. If our hypothesis is correct, it was not the high priesthood claimed by the Zadokites of the second temple. The priesthood of Aaron had been a subordinate priesthood under the authority of the Davidic king. The king possessed a royal high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. We know that some Jews of the Second Temple period believed that this true high priesthood went back to the distant past, to the time of the patriarchs. This priesthood had been passed down from the patriarchs to the prophets and then also to the kings. The Christians knew this. Jesus was prophet, high priest, and king after the order of Melchizedek and was seen as superior to the Aaronic priests. The Christian priesthood was the royal priesthood restored, as mentioned in 1 Peter. This is the high priesthood that the Zadokites had imitated and tried to suppress. Margaret Barker sums up the issue. The debate about Melchizedek is the debate about the nature of high priesthood, the original high priesthood, which was eclipsed during the time of the Aaronites and restored in the church. Thank you.